Hello everyone, Dr. Carroll here, University of Chemistry 1112, University of Chemistry, University of Winnipeg Chemistry 1112. This is Screencast WU13 Lecture 4, so Chapter 13, Kinetics Lecture 4, and this will be the last lecture in this chapter. We're on page 651, looking at catalysis, so catalysts, and I scrawled in here in purple on the top. A catalyst speeds up a reaction by creating an alternate reaction mechanism lower in activation energy. If somehow it's higher in activation energy, we call that creature an inhibitor. But um, catalyst is what we're focusing on here. And you decide to put a catalyst into a system, and then it gets regenerated and can be used again. Now, eventually it does... Uh, deteriorate and you can't use it forever but you can use it a lot which is why some industries will spend lots of money on a catalyst because otherwise a reaction won't happen it will just be unfeasible in terms of uh, production time to happen so catalysts will be expensive for many industrial processes but the fact they can be used again and again makes it worth the industry's while or else they wouldn't do it Catalysts can be homogeneous, that means they're in the same phase as the reactants, or heterogeneous, where they're in different phase than uh, the reactants. Uh, so here we see we have A aqueous plus B aqueous, and then often the catalyst is put over the reaction arrow, the symbolism is that way, C aqueous, and then it goes to D aqueous plus E aqueous. So that is a homogeneous catalysis system. You don't have to have the products, by the way, the same phases as the reactants, but the reactants and the catalyst all have to be the same phase if you will designate that process as homogeneous catalysis. Heterogeneous means different, so the phase, here we have carbon solid, and we have A gas and B gas, uh, so the phases are different, and that's heterogeneous catalysis. Uh, the phases of the products uh, aren't part of the definition. Um, heterogeneous catalysis is used in the catalytic converter in your car, the catalytic converter is in the exhaust system, this uh, cylinder pan looking thing with a bunch of solid beads, could be platinum, rhodium, uh, niobium, other products could be used, other pellets, which stick the gases on to active sites and that allows greater uh, rearrangement possibilities, speeds up the reaction to products which are less noxious gases. And still you get formed carbon dioxide and that's a greenhouse gas so that's a whole other story. Um, so uh, we see here if we can't always increase the rate of reaction by changing the temperature the catalyst uh, happens. It's uh, I remember reading a book where it said, catalysts don't participate in a reaction. I said, why would you write that? If a catalyst doesn't participate in a reaction, why would you ever put it in? Um, agreed, it is not part of the overall stoichiometry, but it does change the mechanism. The catalyst always participates in an early step, not necessarily the first step, but an early step of a reaction mechanism. But when the reaction is over, the catalyst is regenerated. Um, when we write a net equation that influenced by a catalyst, we write the formula above or below the reaction arrow. Remember, there's a difference between a catalyst and an intermediate. A catalyst is a reactant in an early step and a product of a later step, whereas an intermediate is a transient, so that means it doesn't last a long time. That is a product in an early step, but consumed in a later step. So uh, we could have, let's say, a catalyst could react with one reactant to give an intermediate. An intermediate could react with another reactant to give products, and then the catalyst comes back. So these catalysts are used up and then regenerated. Intermediates are produced and then used up. And uh, we have an example here of catalysis causing uh, problems with ozone in the stratosphere where you can have a chlorofluorocarbon, CFC, for example, CF2Cl2, um, ends up diffusing into the stratosphere and then sunlight can break it down. So you got this monatomic chlorine, which reacts with O3 and forms ClO, which is an intermediate, 
and then you see the CL reforming so it could attack more ozone. Um, the net effect, you have um, O3 plus O goes to 2O2. So you end up with the uh, chlorine causing more damage. Here's with pictures, chlorine and O3, so you form a CLO bond in O2. Then the CLO acts with O, and you get O2 forming again, and Cl forming, which can do other things. Okay. Um, let's see what else we have to say here. We have... Uh, a graph showing the uncatalyzed process, so this is a potential energy curve for O3 plus O goes to O2 plus O2. That's in blue, a direct reaction, so it is slower, and then you see the catalyzed reaction, which has got um, often in the first course, we just sort of blur it as one curve. But if you really want to look at it, you could look at separate activation energies. We won't get into that too, too much, but we'll just say that there are um, lower activation energies for the catalyzed than the uncatalyzed uh, case. That's the main point to make there. Um, okay, and then... We have here some examples of uh, there's a catalytic converter on the right there. You see there, which is heterogeneous. There's other ones. I'm not going to go over through all of these. Uh, I did want to talk about this, though, uh, just the idea of uh, a bed of solid pellets on which a gas can go over. So here we have nitrogen monoxide forming nitrogen and oxygen on a platinum metal surface. So we've got a bunch of platinum spheres here. And nitrogen and oxygen are formed when NO uh, smashes into other NOs, right? And that can happen randomly all over the place. You can have these guys going every which way. And if you're lucky, they'll hit each other. And sometimes they'll get nitrogen and oxygen. But you can increase the chance that what that happens and thereby increase the rate of the reaction if you start with adsorption. Not, it's not adsorption, it's adsorption. It's a P. A-D-S-O-R-P-T-I-O-N. So uh, the starting materials bind to the surface of the catalyst. So the NO, and there's another NO molecule, there's a... Uh, binding on what's called active sites on the platinum and then they start to see each other they start to migrate move along that surface and then you start to form bonding so the oxygen start to form and leave and then you got the nitrogens which will eventually uh, form a bond and leave as well so that's desorption so it's adsorption migration reorganization desorption so that's the four step process in heterogeneous catalysis. It's a simplified view, but uh, it is a powerful technique. Um, then uh, catalysts are used just for your own knowledge and refining petroleum products, which is pretty darn important. Uh, chemicals from coal use uh, heterogeneous catalysis. And uh, back to some industrial ideas for what catalysts are used for. Biocatalysts, enzymes are examples of biocatalysts, and you can read that on your own. Uh, we won't um, uh, have to go into details about enzymes, which are biological catalysts. One guy who looked at catalysis was this guy, John Polanyi, who in 1986 I got to hear speak uh, at a chemical conference at the University of Toronto. I lived in Hamilton at the time, so it wasn't a big deal for us. A bunch of guys from our uh, research group uh, took the drive from Hamilton to Toronto. 
and saw uh, Polanyi uh, speak. So I thought that was sort of interesting. Um, okay, there's some enzyme kinetics. I don't care about that. Can't do everything. Um, what do we have here? 13.7.2. Which of the following are true? Uh, the concentrations of a homogeneous catalyst appear in the rate law. Well, that I don't know. It uh, it might. You need more information to uh, to get the answer to that. What did they say about that one? Now I'm curious. Um, I want to look at 13.7.2 section exercises. It says true. Uh, well, we don't have enough information about that. I, they may appear in the rate law. Okay, that's something that skipped up. So I'm going to forget about them, that one. Part B, a catalyst changes an endothermic into an exothermic. Not necessarily. It lowers the activation energy, but it doesn't change the value of delta H. So no, it does not change endothermic into exothermic. A catalyst lowers the activation energy of the rate determining step. Um, well, it changes the mechanism, so it changes the rate determining step. And uh, yeah, so I guess that would be true. But it's, there's going to be new rate determining steps, so that's a pretty fuzzy question. The catalyst is a reactant in an early step, a mechanism in a product in a later step. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so um, let me show you where we're going to see catalysts more more often. There's my visual summary. I'm going to go to the um, the paint, and uh, here I've started to draw an endothermic potential energy profile. So let's say in this example, the potential energy of the reactants is zero and the delta H reaction is 30. So from reactants to produ products, we got 30 kilojoules. Uh, EA forward is 110. So from wherever the reactants are zero up to 110, that is going to be the activated complex. Now I can just join in. So it goes zero to 110 and then back down. Uh, to the products, which are 30. So from the reactants to the top of the hill, that's EA forward. From the products to the top of the hill, that's EA reverse, so 110 minus 30. So EA reverse equals 30 kilojoules. Potential energy of the products is 30. EA reverse isn't 30. Why did I say that? It is 80. 80 kilojoules. Potential energy of the products is 30. Okay, so everything works fine. So there's no catalyst mentioned here. If I did add a catalyst, and I'm just trying to think how I changed the color on this uh, drawing. It's like, really? It's got to be, this is the fill. Um, you have to help me here. Where brush width hardness, there's got to be a way to change uh, the color. Here's my paintbrush, right? Okay. Um, my paint buckets, you're all saying, oh, he's... oh, that's great. Okay, we undo that. Okay, I don't care about the paint bucket. It's all gonna, this is all going to be in black. And you'll tell me, send me a message how using paint.net. I'm able to change the color. So if I use a catalyst, let's say the catalyst lowers, there's a different path and it lowers the activation energy. So it just is at 100. So what's that 100? The activated complex is just at 100. So the forward activation energy is now 100, not 110. And the reverse activation energy is now 70 instead of 80. But notice that my delta H of the reaction is going to stay the same at 30. So the catalyzed process gives you a shortcut to get from reactants to products, but it doesn't change how much energy is inputted to make this reaction happen. Okay, let's try one exothermic case here. 
And of course you can tell I'm still looking at how to change the inverted colors for horizontal view edit. Okay, well, let's try a new one here. And let's say this is exothermic. So uh, you have reactants A plus B goes through an activated complex to C plus D plus 80 joules, let's say. So that would mean that delta H reaction is minus 80 joules. And let's just say the potential energy of the reactants combined was 20 joules. And let's say Ea forward is 50 joules. So let's get Ea reverse potential energy of the products, and then talk about catalysts. Okay, so I think if I go from 100 above to 100 below, I should be good. Not 1,000, 100 below. And there's my zero. So this potential energy versus reaction pathway. What's this thing here? That's what I'm talking about. There you go. There's a little color wheel in the top right. So there's my reactants at 20. There's my products at, I don't know where they are yet, but I know that the delta reaction, H reaction is minus 80. So they have to be 60 down from 20 to give you a difference of minus 80, right? So that's my delta H of reaction. I could use those equations before, but sometimes you can just use a graph. So products are sitting pretty at minus 60. Okay, good. Now the forward activation energy is 50. You started at 20, so my activated complex is going to be at 70. And now I'm going to join the curve. We don't know the actual slopes of the curve. That's a few years down the road to get that. So reactants to the top of the hill, that is my forward activation energy. Oh, now that I have the color wheel, we can have some fun with it, right? So from 20 to 70, so that is uh, EA forward. And the uh, products, um, well, they're sitting at minus 60, and they got to go up to uh, 70, so that is, excuse me, that is 130. Does that make sense? If this is 130, what was my forward activation energy? 50. Uh, and this thing here is minus 80, so 80 and 50 is 130, yeah. And you see that that's the case. And everything's labeled, so this is a potential energy profile. If I put in a catalyst, I may not know the fine details of it, but I do know that it will have to lower the activation energy. So you can draw it as ever, all sorts of little bumps and waves, but... I can just make it here. So this is the catalyzed uh, peak region. And you see that the forward activation energy and reverse activation energy are both lowered by the same amount. So we still release 80 kilojoules or 80 joules here. Still exothermic, we release 80. We just release it more quickly if we introduce a catalyst, whether heterogeneous or homogeneous catalyst into the... Uh, into the story. So that is uh, it for chapter 13, a long chapter, an important one, and uh, there's end of chapter program uh, problems for you to look at, and of course the fun Wiley Plus to take a look at, and that package of old uh, tests from years 1991 for you to look at as well. That was 1991 BC. Okay, have fun.